title I was given. The, the task of talking a little bit about um, <clears throat> what is open access anyway, and I, and I thought about that and said, you know, that's not really quite the right topic for this audience. If you had no idea what that was, it's highly unlikely that you'd be here. So I thought, I thought it was important then to focus my remarks on what I'm going to call a call for collective action for a collective good. And I'd like to spend just a few minutes um, making some observations and, and sharing a perspective for, uh, with you. <clears throat> we have a few drivers today. One of those drivers is an opportunity to return really to the values that drew many of us into, into this field, the noble idea of, of access and how uplifting and, and literally um, critical that is in terms of advancing knowledge uh, in, a, in a very, very broad sense. We have business mandates uh, that really require that we, we look at the business dimensions of the operations that we run and are a part of in ways that we can respond to these larger these larger challenges. And thirdly, we really have a, an opportunity today to take this discussion to a level where we can look at a community purpose. And by community, I'm thinking in the broad sense, the community of informationists. And I'm going to define that today as scientists, li librarians, funding agencies, et cetera, those working together essentially to advance science and knowledge for the betterment of, of this planet that we live on. So within that context, where in the world does all of this fit? And why open access? In the library world, clearly this has long been seen as a possible solution to the serials pricing crisis, probably too limited of a perspective to take. Over the past decade, we've seen enormous investments in infrastructure, great debates, but real change has been very, very difficult to see. In fact, it doesn't seem we're much closer than we were about a decade ago. Looking back, we might pick up some in inspiration for devising new strategies that bring about the true goal of open access, accelerating research closer. We have learned, I think, many of us, that in the last decade, in trying to get this flywheel started and really moving, that it's not possible to do that without keeping the scholar and the scientists essentially absolutely at the center of this process. And so that really begins to suggest how we might think about some different propositions in terms of moving forward. I want to put out a call that we stop pointing fingers at various players in the, in the informationist community, that we stop looking for per, the perfect formula. Perfection indeed is, uh, is difficult to find. But that we seize the opportunity to take control, to be an active shareholder in owning a part of the communication of science. And that's really what scope three is about, in a sense, as I view it, the opportunity to be a shareholder with all the things that that sort of entails from the perspective of looking at, at a business dimension. I want to observe that those who don't learn from the future are indeed destined to make mistakes in it. Um, and so we have learned, I think, a few things in the past in looking at <clears throat> what, what, was, what was a good idea, what was possibly not such a good idea, and then moving around and around in circles related to that. We might instead focus a little bit on opportunities as it gives us, an oppor as it gives us the option to look at uh, where we go. So stepping back, the intersection of physics and the practice of physics and libraries and librarianship managing information really provides, I think, a case uh, for inspiration and, and some examples of leadership. 1989, Tim Berners-Lee at CERN inventing the World Wide Web clearly dramatically changed all our lives. In 1991, I joined the laboratory at Los Alamos National Laboratory and had this wild and crazy guy come in, Paul Ginsberg, talking to me about running a preprint system on his desktop for the high energy physics community. And I kind of thought about it and I said, you know, I don't know that this is going to work. It seems pretty crazy. But if it does, the library better somehow be involved in that. And so it was an opportunity, not knowing what was in front of us, to get in on the ground of something that clearly has had a very, very large impact in the physics community and is at the center of, high, of, of communication in high energy physics today. In 1999, sitting in my office with the same character, Paul Ginsberg, another wild character, Herbert von Sampel, and myself, sitting around a table asking the question, why hasn't the open access idea permeated? 
why haven't the lessons out of the archive moved into other fields? What could we do to enable that? We decided to call a meeting in Santa Fe, called the Santa Fe Convention, and pull together some people to brainstorm about how we might go forward to, to sort of launch an effort to move things in a direction. That led essentially to the Open Archives Initiative, which has become a global enabler. Modest, but a step forward. In 2003, I had the opportunity to participate with some colleagues of mine at the Max Planck Society in Munich. As we did some planning for what became the in 2003, the Ber Berlin Declaration on Open Access uh, to information both in the sciences and the humanities. That moved from an idea to really a sense of global awareness, just about everywhere but in the USA. In 2007, I think we have an opportunity, those of you in this room, to be at another pivot point in terms of, once again, taking things forward one step at a time. And that's really what scope three represents in my own mind. Thinking about the future of libraries, they clearly intersect scholarly communication. The notion of library as publisher and or enabler, but certainly a custodian of some sense of sustainability. The prospect on the horizon, very, very close horizon I might add, of being in a, in a, in a role that's collaborative in the area of e-science, where we're creating new models and new paradigms for how we think about handling large data sets, the software that really enables people to begin to talk to one another and work across communities is an enormous opportunity that we cannot afford to miss. So again, we have an opportunity to be a stockholder in a major part of the physics information enterprise. As, as stockholders, we have the opportunity to aggregate our voices and influence a direction. Sometimes it's hard to pay attention to what's happening around you, even though it's, it's changing in ways that one ought to take notice of. If you can't read this in the back, it says, I know you may miss the Wainwrights, Bobby, but they were weak and stupid people, and that's why we have wolves and other large predators. <laughs> Indeed, I think for me, this says something about our environment, um, and, and I hope I'm not uh, Bobby, um, and, but indeed trying to pay attention of, of what is in front of us. Certainly, the physicist, the scientist, aren't sitting back and waiting. They are taking matters into their own hands, launching things on their own. So it's a question now really of being at the center of things or literally being out of the game. It's, it's in many ways that binary. Decision making is difficult for many of us where we live in complex organizations. We need, I think, I've learned over my career, uh, too many years to recount, um, two important lessons. First of all, quality is, rel is a relative thing. Good enough, one needs to be good enough where it has to be, better where it needs to be, but not better than what it needs to be at that moment in time. Secondly, perfect is the enemy of the good. Over 90% of the innovators, and uh, you can cite classic example after classic example, started by following the wrong strategy, but were doggedly persistent in terms of iteration iteration and iteration. One doesn't make that progress though without the iteration, without trying something and moving it forward. One doesn't make progress by sitting back and saying, well, we don't quite have the perfect experiment to launch, so let's not do any experiment at all. There's some militating factors uh, I want to observe in our community that might argue that we ought not to take a step today in terms of really why, why, dramatically in some ways embracing the opportunity in front of us. The Berlin Declaration that I mentioned, I would stand back and observe there are six U.S. signatories, but no university presence. Yes, the U.S. is very distributed, universities act on their own, but we also have a highly geocentric view of the world the Berlin Declaration, after all, a European idea, right? A European initiative, what does that have to do with us? When really it was about the whole question of bringing an awareness and some action related to open access. Perhaps the wrong take that we took. The idea of pursuing perfection, and so we're very, very good at argumentation, sometimes at the cost of forward action. A call to move from me to us. Scope three, clearly, as you're going to hear, 
I think, in very, very, from different perspectives, but over and over again today. Scope three will entail a higher call than to focus on just my institution. How does the formula work for my self-interest? And how do we make that something that works for our community? It's surprising uh, in my field, uh, many of us, uh, I, I get often criticized for using sport analogies, but I'm gonna use this one because it's sort of part of our cultural fabric. We have a lot of Monday morning quarterbacks uh, sitting in their arm check, armchairs, dissecting what, what was said on Peter Suber's blog and well, why, why don't I agree exactly with this and what was said the next day, et cetera, et cetera, vicariously entertaining themselves by reading the blog again as opposed to taking action. So we need to use some approaches that require some evolutionary options, launching some multiple experiments. I want to, I want to observe a little bit in terms of uh, from an evolutionary perspective, taking a little bit of inspiration from Darwin and thinking about library organizations. Environmental change and ev evolution clearly apply not just in the physical world, in the biological world, they apply in the organizational world, the world of organizations. Businesses, successful ones, those still around, have evolved from predictability and long-term planning to those who are able to embrace rapid changes, unpredictability, and global competition. Organizations, consequently, have evolved from elaborate and complex hierarchies to new organizational forms, virtual, flat, et cetera, et cetera, constantly mutating, changing. And individuals in this context, in these organizations, have also had to change. Not just what they do, but how they think about what their job is. And that is much of what our challenge is today. So to take inspiration from evolution, which is this fabulous selection engine, taking billions and billions of options, constantly throwing them out there, which result in these highly creative and innovative designs, we can learn some lessons. Let me share just three. First of all, we can look at evolution as a model and map how things evolve. In computing, for example, genetic algorithms have this idea of offspring. They mutate into more effective algorithms. They mutate, and that process continues. That's now been put on steroids where you're essentially taking multiple hypotheses, throwing them out, and iterating very, very quickly over time as opposed to it in a serial fashion. So we're seeing this very much in the, in the computational field. Successful adapters see things with fresh eyes. They move fast, they're among the first to respond when the environment shifts, and they quickly differentiate themselves from their closest rivals. Thirdly, Instinct plays a crucial role. Many of you are here today because you have an instinct that there's an important conversation about to occur, and you're, you're keenly interested to understand what that conversation is about and what it might mean for your institution. They're also able to intuit danger and opportunity. They act decisively. So to be adaptive, to be more innovative, you, one must be more innovative and experimental. The application of all of this to open access is that as open access, as things become more and more open, open and with open access, it, our, our view of the traditional library in many ways becomes more irrelevant. Standing as a director of libraries in an institution, frequently interacting with institutional players, what I can tell you is that we're not talking in terms of funding library collections, funding libraries, funding these kinds of efforts. We're not talking about a library phenomena. We're talking about an issue of institutional economics. So it's not about library economics, it's about institutional economics. And the sooner we understand that and understand what drives our institutional economics, the more successful we'll be able then to position ourselves in terms of where we are. So we can underestimate how radical the implication of those changes are, and that will fundamentally offer alter our roles. Thus, we should never, ever think outside of the box. Um, this is one of my favorite cartoons, and I'm continually asked sometimes, now, are we supposed to be in that box or not? Can we think innovatively? And that's, and that's in many ways the challenge for us as we go home from this conference about the challenges in front of us in terms of adopting and making this kind of a model work in our own institutional setting. And it requires a shift from product focus, subscription models, et cetera, to, to questions like how do we support, how, are, how do we become at the center of team science? 
Sometimes that involves thinking about the problem of spinning yet one more plate a different way. As we're able to conceptualize that, it becomes clear that sometimes we can't individually spin another plate. We have to collaboratively, collectively take on the task. So I'm going to end by, by again, sharing an observation. When I'm asked um, to think about an, a new opportunity, when I'm asked to come out to, to a place like Berkeley, I'm continually weighing options about the use of my time, my energy. I'm making those same decisions in my institution. There's n number of choices and opportunities where we can look at how to spend our time and energy and how we can pursue with passion, knowledge, and commitment noble endeavors. So the first question I always ask is, is it interesting? Is it important? And what about it is important? And thirdly, does it intersect in terms of what's realistic? What I find fascinating about the discussion that we will have over the course of the, of the day is that for me, and I think for many of you, these three circles really do intersect in a new and different way. I want to close by sharing a, a vision uh, that I put down on paper uh, a decade or so ago. I was challenged by some people to put, that, put, to put that vision down, and I did. And so I often look back again at what I'm going to do uh, as I get up and, and move forward, as I make decisions and so forth, and it, does it still resonate with my own vision? In some ways, I want to share the vision because I think it's a vision that, in, that could possibly um, intersect the space that we're talking about. So I believe that we must do much more than aggregate and provide access to digital scientific information. Our job now, today, is to wire people's brains together so that sharing, reasoning, and collaboration become part of everyday work. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.